Hello, welcome to uh, the program, the podcast from Jack Clinical Electrophysiology. It's a great pleasure for me today to have uh, a dear friend and a colleague, uh, Dr. Roderick Tong, Professor, University of Arizona, Phoenix, Chief of Cardiology, who is presenting the late breaking clinical trial on uh, cardioneural ablation, the US uh, registry study. Uh, Rod, thank you so much for joining us. Shiv, thanks for having me. Um, uh, we're going to kick off this presentation by showing you a few slides as an introduction, and we will be seeking uh, Dr. Tang's expert opinion on what his study shows. So there are a uh, topic of interest, of course, is these structures sitting on the heart, which is called the ganglionated plexi. So what are these plexi? So by way of introduction, here is a two images. One is from the Amaraya collection, which is the uh, view of uh, the hu a human cadaver in which the nerves have been clearly dissected out to show you nerve fibers, both sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve fibers that come from higher levels of the neuraxis to the heart. What you see on the right panel are fat pads on the surface of the heart. They have individual names based on their locations. And this is where these nerve fibers come in synapse. And these ganglionated plexi actually are little brains in the heart. And they give nerve fibers to various structures within the heart that controls the heart's electrophysiology. Shown over here, uh, you can see that these fat pads are located um, in the, both the ventral and dorsal regions of the heart. And some of them have very specific functions, including controlling the AV node and the SA node. And they have been proposed as targets for catheter ablation uh, of uh, bradycardia, syncope, and also for atrial fibrillation. Um, there's a very exciting study, a late breaker at this meeting, which is cardioneural ablation for functional bradycardia and vasovagal syncope. The outcomes from the US multi-center CNA registry, which is being simultaneously published in Jack Clinical Electrophysiology. It's being accompanied with an editorial commentary. Let me turn it over to Dr. Tang. Uh, Rod, could you walk us through the study and I'll control the slides. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Shiv. This study is really on behalf of 15 centers and, and even a lot of the giants that started this field of cardinal ablation really came from Dr. Pachon in Brazil in the early 2000s. And there's been a lot of excitement about the potential value of a very novel catheter-based ablation procedure in which we're actually rewiring the heart and trying to protect it from excessive vagal tone or an excessive basal gerish response. And essentially what we looked at is over 15 centers, patients that are young, that don't want to have pacemakers, don't wish to have them, that might have a functional situational bradycardia with a resultant hemodynamic collapse or syncope. Those patients underwent catheter-based catheter -based ablation in a compassionate off-label uh, strategy. And I think that there's been enough momentum and interest in this that clearly we would love to see something more systematic and something that's approved, but this is really a summary of the experience collectively over six years at multiple U.S. centers. Rod, I took the liberty to uh, pull up an image from your slide, which actually shows, uh, you know, well, the first question electrophysiologists ask is who, who to ablate, where to ablate, how to ablate, and how much to ablate. So uh, using your own figure uh, your, from your investigators, could you uh, give us an overview of what uh, this image is showing to the audience? Right, and Shiv, the first question of who, who are we ablating, it's a great question. There needs to be some documented rhythm evidence of a functional bradycardia or, or as a result of, that results in vasovagal syncope or it could even be AV block or sinus pauses. This could either be in the form of an ILR or a Holter or some sort of remote telemetry. And in those patients that are, not ref that are refractory to either medical therapy, as we know, there aren't great therapies for vasovagal syncope, I would remind the audience that even in VPS1 and VPS2, pacemakers don't systematically benefit patients. And then you've got midodrin and Florinef for some of these orthostatic-induced vasovagal episodes. So really, we're looking for younger patients that are having these functional bradycardia syndromes. And what we're targeting, as you've mentioned, are these ganglionate plexus regions that really are paraceptal. They're often in between the right atrium and the left atrium in these inner atrial 
um, grooves in sulci. And it's actually like where Watterson's groove is when you cut in, right, as a surgeon. And then you've got the ones that cluster around the left superior pulmonary vein, the martial regions. And what's interesting about this that we don't fully understand the mechanism is when you affect these with some sort of cryothermy or with heat, radio frequency, which was used in this experience, you get these very, I wouldn't say predictable, but characteristic responses where you can get a vaguely mediated response where you get a long pause or an asystolic response or around the left superior. And we typically see heart rate acceleration. Shiv, your group really beautifully showed in CERC research the innervation of the sinus node around the RAGP around that region in the left atrial septal side and the right RA side and the SVC aortic facing. That's where we typically see accelerations of heart rate during ablation. And in most of these cases, we're looking for a final endpoint of increasing the heart rate by 10 or 20. That's uh, that's really interesting. You know, the, uh, it's interesting that you also show very good examples of vagal response. Now, uh, here is a, uh, uh, again, a figure. Thank you for providing this to us. Uh, could you just sort of make a comment about what you saw in this case where you obviously have had an impact, I would say, uh, on the REGP uh, uh, ultimately as a sort of approximate region that controls the SA node. Yes, I think for those that don't have experience doing this, you all have had experience in it if you've done a catheter ablation, because we know that we often get unintentional changes in heart rate autonomic tone after ablation. That's been known for decades with AVNRT. It's clearly observed when you're doing a wide WACA around the right anterior portion. And what we're doing is we're not ablating an arrhythmia. We've always joked about this is non-arrhythmic ablation which is why it's so novel. And what we're doing is we're intentionally targeting that right anterior GP region to assess for an increase in heart rate. And here you can see, starting at 67, often intra-ablation or RF application, you'll see an acceleration. And in this case, which is very dramatic, you know, went from 60 to 90, and then, then eventually you target the right atrial side of it and you can get acceleration up to 100, 110. What your third question was, how much do ablate? Well, we don't want a runaway sinus node as well. So we typically titrate to very mild sinus tachycardia, somewhere around 100, 105. This was a very exuberant response, a right, right anterior GP. That's, that's very useful, Rod. Um, one of the most remarkable aspects of this study is this slide. And of course, uh, you know, the editorial board looked at this very carefully and we've followed this uh, research very closely. Uh, this, our interpretation of this is, these are patients who have suffered a lot. And uh, this is, the title of the editorial is, of course, A New Hope. So could you sort of give a context for us uh, for the types of patients you've taken care of? And um, also perhaps a quick note about uh, side effects and complications, which is expected of any procedures, but really where the field can eventually go. So. I think that this is, we often think about syncope as something that's just a pure quality of life issue, but when it results in hard syncope or facial trauma, we've had a patient that drove here from Detroit with, that wore a helmet every day because they were so concerned, they were so um, debilitated by their syncope. So I agree. I think the operative word here is debilitating. And you can see even the upper inner quartile, there is 15 episodes of fainting the malignant vasovagal syncope is real. And we're not looking for the patient with their first episode of vasovagal syncope or someone that has easy behavioral modifications, right? That can mitigate this risk. These are patients that are desperate for a solution. And I think traditionally, other than, you know, squeezing your leg, increasing venous return, TED hose, there aren't many options for these patients. So this does give hope. And we did find that in about two thirds of these patients, the presenting syndrome was actually syncope. And of these that present with syncope, you can see there's a significant reduction from a median of seven to zero episodes at just over one year. Obviously, long-term uh, follow-up is going to be important because we want to know about reinnervation. But you're looking at a success rate of around 78%, in which 97% of this cohort remain free of a pacemaker. And I think in the community, Shiv, it's so common for us to just see pacemakers go in um, for relatively soft indications without much evidence to support that they will benefit patients systematically. And in many cases, we know it actually, the pacemakers don't benefit. And um, we too have come across patients 
in whom the pacemaker didn't benefit and we went ahead and did cardioneural ablation. So uh, in other words, catheter ablation in some ways rescues a unnecessary procedure in the first place, which is the pacemaker. Uh, so could you make a very quick note about uh, the uh, complications encountered in this study, uh, which, uh, which of course comes up, but I think that some of that uh, may uh, not exactly be related to the procedure itself. What are your thoughts? Well, the juice has to be worth the squeeze, right? So you can't be doing this on people that have minimal episodes. And I, we would not endorse this on patients that had one or two episodes, but obviously the severity of the syncope would justify those that have lower number of episodes. Again, I remember a young woman in our Chicago experience that actually chipped her tooth and had facial fractures from infrequent episodes, but severe consequences. So the complication rate that we saw was just under 5%. And this would include even anesthesia related with respiratory failure after, as this is typically done under conscious sedation. The ones that were concerning is two tamponades. And we even had a death in this cohort that did not appear to be related from the procedure that was several weeks after um, the procedure. So just like all procedures, anything invasive is going to have inherent risks to it. It's our job to mitigate these risks and make them as, as, as low as we possibly can. And obviously, safe procedures are so critical before this gets generalized and broadly applied globally. Well, thank you for that, uh, Rod. And uh, we appreciate you and your investigators for uh, working with us uh, for giving us such an exhaustive uh, sort of set of peer review responses, which I can share with the uh, uh, our listeners that that's a uh, a bar that we uh, expected of of these investigators, which is the leading experts in the world today. Um, I, I'd like to, of course, say that you know on behalf of the journal, we really felt that this is an important study to get to the world because. Um, Further studies have to be done, and I think we've reached now a threshold where uh, we can and should get this message across for getting the types of studies that are needed to firmly establish this in care. Uh, Rod, I'll turn you I'll turn it back to you so that if you had any uh, final comments before we sign off. Well, with regard to future directions, where do we go from here? And I think that those that are enthusiasts of this procedure will be delighted to see these these outcomes. Again, as we've discussed, we have to mitigate the risk for procedural complications. And hopefully with little things like ultrasound access, intracardiac echo, et cetera, we have made improvements over decades for, for EP procedures, just like we're seeing with AFib as first line. Back then we would never accept PVI as first line, but now we're starting to see with more experience, that would be the case. This is clearly begging for a sham controlled randomized trial that would be multi-centric. And, you know, the late Roman Pierczowski um, did pioneer that in Poland and pulled, pulled off a beautiful single center and showed a very significant reduction in recurrent syncope, just like we've shown that approaches around 80%. So I think the world is starving for a randomized trial shift, and hopefully there's a lot of collective interest, but we need to study this carefully, show that it can be done safely across multiple operators, and then we need to unify and understand procedural endpoints and know how much to do and understand re which your group will probably teach us as well as how long does this last for? And so many more questions and that's what's humbling about trying to advance science. Well, thank you so much for that, Rod. And also, uh, you know, a shout out for Roman Petrovsky, who's a wonderful human being. We miss him, uh, passed away way too soon. And uh, again, uh, his study also was published in Jack EP a few years ago. Congratulations to you and your colleagues. Uh, enjoy uh, HRS 2025 and keep inspiring uh, the next generation and all our colleagues in the field, Rod. Thank you so much. Thank you.